Why, hello. Whoa. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. So so here's the thing is is uh I I was I was totally looking at the other screen while while we were getting mm -hmm. ready to roll here. Uh, uh -huh. Hello and welcome to uh, a new episode of <laughs> Owl Bear Soup. Uh, today's mm -hmm. recipe includes uh, me as one of your hosts, and uh, oh, and me as the other one. I'm Rich. Hi. <laughs> I'm over. You're, you're yeah. this. Oh yeah. gosh, <laughs> we're getting used to this. We're trying something new. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so everyone, uh, you, you know, if you're familiar with the show, we have a normal kind of flow. Things are going to get broken up a little bit today because two things: one, we we didn't book a guest, and number two, we have done a software update upgrade, uh, changing things around a little bit with the software we're using and mm -hmm. uh, seeing how that works for us. Uh, so far. I have to say that I am really enjoying the new software that we're using for this stream. Um, it was a breeze to set everything up. Uh, you're coming through clearly. Everybody's coming through clearly. Awesome. It was easy to add folks. <laughs> Everything's great. Anyway, hi, I'm Justin, and I'm one of the hosts of Owlbear Soup. And I didn't give Rich a time <laughs> right. to introduce himself. Oh, I did. I did. I'm oh, Rich, did. the other host. Yes. Um, <laughs> I like to. It's. I like to think that that is like adding salt to the soup. You know, in a recipe when it says like add salt to taste and it tells you that four times and I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it every time because uh, I don't know better. <laughs> right. <Exactly>. That's me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, let's. I guess let's start with um, where we normally start is uh, did you do any gaming this week? What kind of gaming did you get into? Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, I did a little bit of gaming, uh, certainly, as we'll talk about a little bit later. I got a chance to play Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, um, mm -hmm. the newest Coded Chronicles game from the Op game. So I'm excited to run you through that in a little bit. Um, other than that, I have been like just entirely like head deep into, is that a word? I don't know. Um, uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Ooh. Uh, it has hit my need for like wide ranging. I don't know. I'm going to go over here now and, and deal with some stuff for a while, which is yeah. endless entertainment. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I'm, I'm not a big Assassin's Creed fan, but, uh, mm -hmm. just because I, I don't like open world games because I need a very linear path unless I'm playing like, yeah. you know, uh, uh, unless I'm playing like destiny with you, you, you and Fletcher. Um, it's, it's definitely one of those things where it's like, Oh, I, uh, it, I don't really like these open world games. I I, I get super, yeah. super bored. And, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, not for me. Uh, I did, yeah, however, enough. I did play some D and D. Um, what? I what? I know I'm in a, I'm in an every other Friday group with, uh, some, uh, some folks who I know through the DJ community. Um, it's, uh, I am playing, uh, my hag named granny, uh, who also, uh -huh. ha and we all got a free feat at, uh, at, at first, uh, at first level, so I went ahead and I gave ourselves, or I gave myself the chef feat. So right. I make cookies. I made druid, uh, druid hexblade, hexblood, uh, who makes cookies and has good berry. Oh, and is fantastic. I, th <laughs> I thought you were about <laughs> to say you were a hexblood hexblade. <laughs> oh, that 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 would be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I think we talked about this character a little bit. Um, yeah. Right. Giving out all these cookies, all the kind of coolness you can do. Plus with the hex blood. I mean, that's a ton of fun. Right. Um, what uh, did you feel like you fit into your first adventure pretty well? Are you, yeah. are you off and running? Off Good. and running. <laughs> yeah. No, this. Uh, so this would, this would be our, our, our second adventure. Um, and yeah, it was fun. So, so the story is, uh, we all kind of came together in this, this, this area through different ways, but we've all had either had dreams or seen this strange plant kind of coming out of the ground. And it's, Ooh. it's, it's creepy. It has weird power. Uh, we all have failed our vibe checks when it comes to interacting with it so far. Well, the two of us who have interacted it, with it, which is, uh, -huh. uh, you know, uh, myself and, uh, actually commander Slither in the chat, um nice <laughs> is, is 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 the other person who had interactions with it and we decided well we need to go to town we're a couple of hermits we need to go to town and figure out if there's anybody smarter than us you know who who can help us with this so we go into town yeah. and uh you know long story short we get we get brought into this group of other misfits in a uh 
a, a tavern that's that's very much like the the uh, the mystical tavern in the DC universe. It's its doors okay. kind of open up to to anything and everything, and you can you can go through stuff. Uh, and the answer is yes, yes, we did fail fail our vibe checks. Um, I was gonna ask. <laughs> yeah, and um, and so so yeah, so so we we've all grouped up now. We have a group. We we know we've been chosen to work together and now we're going to go join the adventurers guild so that we can level up before we go deeper into yeah. our investigation on this strange thing but the best part is we had to name our our, our adventuring party okay uh, we are root of the uh, problem i mean that's <laughs> That's very good. I like right? that. Yeah, I like yeah. That. <laughs> it's really good. It's really good. I mean, the other the other one I thought was was you know I, I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, you know, uh, I thought it'd been fun to be roots uh, as well mm -hmm. since we're dealing with this weird plant. But um, yeah, no, no, it's 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 so far it's a ton of fun. It's a cool cast. Uh, yeah. There's a a, a a changeling bard. Uh, there is a, a gnomish uh, monk who is is the other uh, hermit who. Uh, Okay. Who, who's who's played by Commander Slither, and or Comrade Slither, and then um, let's see, me monk. I don't know. There's some other stuff, but the important ones yeah. are me and the monk. I think. The, oh, so there's a a Goliath barbarian, and then I think the uh, other one is a warlock or a sorcerer. But yeah, the the Goliath barbarian is fantastic as well. Yep. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Comrade Slither, for keeping me on top of things. Oh yeah, and the pirate Ooh. rogue. I forgot about the pirate rogue. Uh, the pirate rogue and the in the in the barbarian are a couple, and they just had a baby, so they kind of swap back and forth a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very but it's, fun, but it's but it's a great party. It's a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying it. I look forward to that game every other week, and uh, yeah. So anyway, so that's yeah. that's the gaming I did. I also downloaded the revised version of Final Fantasy VII to play it again, but with okay. PS5 graphics and the added interlude. Um, Part right. of the, par, part of the reason I downloaded it and I'm going to play through the remake again is because I was playing it on my PS4, and if you remember, I drilled holes in the top of my PS4's box because it sounded like a helicopter. Right, yeah, right, right. I do remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Integrate. Uh, integrate. Yeah. Uh, yep. Um, and and so yeah, so it's it, it's really it's really interesting to actually be able to hear everything. So I'm mm -hmm. super excited about diving into that. I haven't done much of it, awesome. but yeah. Yeah, so that's my gaming I, for the week. Gosh, I really want to check that out. Now you've, you're selling me on it with the like upgrade for mm -hmm. PS5. Um, and then also the interlude, right, is yep. introducing another character. Is it introducing Yuffie? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, <laughs> and I remember liking Yuffie a lot. So yeah. um, I have to dig it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into it. Well, shoot. Well, I already beat it. Now I got to. Mm, all right. We'll see. We'll see. Well, maybe, though. That sounds I mean, fun. <laughs> what you, you what you can do is if you've uploaded your save on your PS4, you can transfer your save to PS5. I'm just Good starting. Point. I'm starting from the beginning because I want to hear what it sounds like. Not from the cockpit of a helicopter. Yeah, uh, it's so cool because that game um, I usually do. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, when I was teaching about linear algebra. Okay, uh -huh. let's get nerdy for a second. Okay, yeah. so like I would get in there and talk about how uh, you could use linear algebra to make polygons move. And that was like part of early computer graphics. And mm -hmm. I would always use the first like Final Fantasy VII um, in order to like show what we dealt with once upon a time. Yeah. <laughs> and like, why is the hair pointy? Because that's a point that I can easily move around in space now. I mean, I'm not putting a curl on that. That's for sure. Right. Um, and it was kids would look at those graphics and go like what in the world like how what no 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 and it would just be like turn it off turn it off um it was great so playing it with like updated graphics is a pretty fantastic experience <laughs> <laughs> uh there is a question from the chat and it says did rich play any games at disney on his birthday oh it was holy Rich's cow. birthday and, it was yes uh i did not forget <laughs> <laughs> um i did get to play a game i got to go to like the one of the reasons we went is because they opened up avengers campus they got all sorts of marvel nonsense everywhere it's fantastic um we got in to ride the new spider-man ride yeah and basically it's a it's a vr experience you're wearing these glasses and you're looking around and uh the the story is Peter Parker and it's just this like, you know, nice young engineer and these other nice young engineers who are totally not superheroes in any way just happen to be developing the tools for Spider-Man, I guess. Mm. Um, 
They build these uh, these spiders and they get loose. And so you have to run around with this VR thing and you are constantly, like, can I even do it on this screen? You're constantly just like, <laughs> um, you, you have to do that with your fingers and it registers you launching webs at different parts of the screen to kind of like defeat this, uh, this horde of enemies. Um, I walked out of it and my arms were exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, uh... But it was fun. <laughs> you know, I I will say like the the Marvel stuff is pretty much like the big reason I do want to go to Disney and check it out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. That's that's there's a flip flip flip. Um, oh, it would have been so fast. I don't even think I could have said it. We we had to do it so fast. Oh, um, and I think the two of us went and we got a score of like three hundred thousand. And as we oh, walked okay. out, we saw the top scores for the day. Like they, I mean. Disney smart. They sell all sorts of, you can buy your own web shooters that will interface with the game and give you different options and give you, uh, it's just wild stuff. So people got like in the millions easily. Um, but it was really fun. <laughs> Very fun. Oh, Recommend. I must have missed that. <laughs> By the way, I must have missed that. Uh, thanks for catching that, uh, Dom. Uh, thanks for the resub, Aubrey Cello. Um, <laughs> more. <laughs> Bring in more subs. Uh <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. I, but, uh, yeah. Did you see that? Did you, and I, you know, and I know the answer to this, but did you see the, the robotic Spider-Man that gets flung through the air? Yes, I did. That, that wonderful mech suit, you know, you just dress a robot up in like some Spider-Man pajamas and it looks pretty realistic. Right. <laughs> it basically gets flung through the air, like 30 feet up um, in this very like, Oh, now there's people. Oh, now there's people. And, in the middle is that still this is that the same person no 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 it's a it's a it's a robot <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome oh. but it was very cool so uh so check out videos of that um it's interesting that that so much of of disney is moving from rides i mean it's sure it still has rides that are like roller coasters and things but into like immersive experiences and vr games yeah is a, is a huge deal you can spend your whole day playing vr games at disneyland if you want to that's awesome so it's kind of fun. Yeah. And, you know, in, in Disney, I will say since since <laughs> Disney's kind of taken over uh, uh, everything, everything <laughs> um, e, I, the VR games that I've played on the Oculus have been fantastic. Um, oh, yeah? Yeah. Totally worth checking it out. Uh, I, uh, I I literally had to like re re uh, reacclimate re my brain as I was climbing up this ladder on the side of this huge cliff. And I looked down and I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I was like, oh, wait, just a video game. Just a video game. All right, we're good. We're good. Yeah. You know, it's weird. It's weird how your, your your brain just kind of loses it a little. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right. Well, should we get into stuff. some news? Let's do it. All right. I'm ready. Grab my news and bring it on over. And uh, you know what? Why don't I kick it off? Because I have the you best news. I have the best news. This is the best news to talk about. Uh, everyone should be super excited about this. Uh, are you familiar with the gaming company Ravensburger? They make like smaller oh. games. Like, uh, yeah. It, yeah. Uh, I think they also do uh, puzzles. Not 100% sure. They do. That. Yeah. Yeah. They, they feel like like a classic German board gaming. Like whenever I get a game from them, yeah. it's like, this is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You want, when, when you think Ravensburger, you think classic, very, very well put together games, games that you're mm -hmm. going to enjoy playing over and over again with your friends. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Real good games. And, and they do, they do put out really good games. And uh, according to uh, board game geek, uh, so there is a game, uh, that uh, Taco Bell is putting out. So, they, according to uh, Board Game Geek, players of this card game will collect a variety of Taco Bell menu items in order to satisfy a crew of hungry Taco Bell fans. So, okay, yeah, it's it's a thing. Uh, you know, like, uh, let's see. Uh, let's 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 see how fancy I can get. Let's see if this will work. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cover my face, maybe. So there's a preview of what the game kind of looks like. Oh so, yeah, yeah, so yeah. So if you see, like, there's the hungry fan. <laughs> There's the different menu uh -huh. items, yeah. So it, and I guess there's some chips. It looks weird. I'm I'm pretty excited about it. I I do want to try it. I don't. I I don't I don't go to Taco Bell. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So it looks like it's gonna have. You know, the rumor is it's gonna release sometime in June 2021. That's that's us. Uh, for about fifteen bucks, Holy fifteen cow. or sixteen bucks, it's going to come with one hundred and twelve meal cards, fifty crew cards, and eighteen chip tokens. 
<laughs> this is really funny. Uh, I can't believe Ravensburger is doing this. Number one, um, gameplay actually reminds me of um, keeping it sexy, the Kenny G board game. Oh, um, that came out uh, <laughs> what a year and a half ago. I have a copy because it's coming to a to a family game night someday. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> I I, sometimes I worry about our family game nights just because of the weird games that you both you and I have collected over the years. Oh my gosh, it's awful. <laughs> it's awful. We will just be subjecting these games to people. Um, <laughs> but I love that this is just a quick little game. That's really funny. I mean, it's supposed to last 20 minutes. It's, yeah, 17 bucks, whatever. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm into it. <laughs> Plus, of course, it'll cost you that much, you know, to uh, to fund the Taco Bell experience like fully and and buy like one of their burrito packs or something. Right. Oh, man. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, my first one up is actually a very small teaser. Um, we know that uh, the very recently we got the announcements for the new D&D books. There's going to be. Um, Oh my gosh, uh, Strixhaven coming in November, mm -hmm. and then in September, it's the other one. My brain is really focused on Strixhaven right now. The, the other Feywild. one is the okay. Feywild Adventure. That's right. Um, but <laughs> we recently got a lot of information about the design studio at Wizards and how they do things. And a lot of it is allowing people on their team to champion products and then, you know, seeing how far they can get through the process. And, um, we have found out from uh, from the head of Dungeons and Dragons um, on Twitter has leaked a little bit more information. Um, they announced Strixhaven pretty early because they needed the UA to come out, which we're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. And so obviously we knew a Strixhaven book would be coming out. However, sometime in between Witchlight and Strixhaven, there will be another official product Wait, coming what? out from D&D. This is the one that James Wyatt is the oh. uh, the proponent of. So I don't know exactly what it's going to be. Um, probably not a huge campaign because there's one coming out the month before. Yeah. Um, maybe it is the Dragon Book that uh, that I've been waiting for. <laughs> yeah. No. And I, I remember James Wyatt's name popping up in a lot of different uh, products that I really loved in Fourth Edition. So I'm I'm, I'm pretty excited to yeah. see his, his name getting slapped on uh, this next product. <laughs> Uh, oh my gosh. Ooh, yes, I just went to do a quick look and saw immediately my author site currently focused on the Draconic Prophecies, my trilogy set in the world of Eberron. Oh. Um, so <laughs> hint, I hint. don't I, I don't know if that's a an actual D&D &D book or if that's a series of novels for the Eberron universe coming out, but I'm seeing dragons in our future. <laughs> well, I'm seeing vampires in my future. And what? yeah, I know. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Vampire to Masquerade. I think it's a great system. I've not played nearly enough of it. Uh, but I really do like, I like that, the 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 pools, the point pool system, the point, mm -hmm. you know, I like those kinds of systems, especially for more modern play. Uh, so Vampire to Masquerade 5th edition is getting some new items in 21, uh, 2021. So first, uh, they're going to get the Book of Nod. So, uh, but they're actually going to get two versions of this. They're going to get the Book of Nod. That's the faux leather bound book with the silver foil and golden, you know, it, and it's going to look really nice. And it, these are, uh, yeah. it's a collection of mythic texts texts for use of in vampire to masquerade um and it's presented in the form of an epic poem so the book of nod is a great in-game resource um but there's also Ooh. going to be the book of nod deluxe artifact edition so 14 uh parchment scrolls uh a handwritten journal a stone tablet uh and all kinds of other cool stuff and i'm pretty excited about that as well and that's coming from wow. Renegade, renegade game studios um, there's also a sec second Inquisition source book. So the secret church and hidden state uh, hunting the hunters in the cities across the continents and antagonists guide to the second rising or the rising of the second Ooh. Inquisition. So uh, what this is going to be is, is opponents for your kindred. So, uh, you know, things like special forces, vampire hunters, that type of stuff. Um, information so, on players. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is going to be like an enemy book, right? Um, all kinds of cool new new tools. Uh, and then, of course, a Vampire to Masquerade dice set because you everybody needs 13 custom black D10s uh, and five red hunger D10s just for playing this game. And I am so into it. That's fantastic. But that's not all. Wow. That's not all. No? Vampire to Masquerade 5th edition core <laughs> rulebook is uh, up for pre-order. 
or is it is it available now? Uh, I think it's up for pre-order on Roll20, which, oh yeah, it is pre-order, ah. which means uh, you're going to get all the fun Roll20 stuff. So you're going to get, uh, you know, the, the, the book, the character sheets, that type of stuff all on, mm -hmm. um, all on Roll20. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty jazzed about, about, uh, yeah. about Vampire. Interesting. Also, also hey, a Tempest Thema. Welcome to the <laughs> Hello, <chat>. hello. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I don't think I've ever played a, a White Wolf game with like a battle mat or anything like that. Um, no, but I am. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm really excited for using Roll20, especially with this, you know, this book of Nod and all those extra features. Like it would be super easy and, and really nice on Roll20 to like to give handouts and have players be able to store them all. Like that was one of my favorite things about the game we played is I don't remember who that NPC is, but I know there was a picture and an outline and I can find it. You know, I don't. Mm -hmm. You know, I had tons of notes just because of the way it was set up. So, yeah, that's exciting. St storyteller games are, are 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 a little bit different in feel than D and D. Um, it just because of the way way it all works. But mm -hmm. um, I could see playing it with a battle mat, and I don't know. I would have to reread the fifth edition book and see if it's really if it would really make sense for combat. Right? Yeah, it, it yeah. may not make sense for for combat in that system. So it could be. All right. Well, uh, my next bit of news is is pretty uh, exciting for me. Um, <laughs> it is a game coming out. It's called Unfathomable. Um, this is a fantasy flight game. Um, we've been teased a little bit with it in the past, but uh, what we've come to learn is that this is a social deduction game set in the Arkham Horror universe. So Cthulhu stuff. You are on a boat and it's a remake of basically the Battlestar Galactica game. So, uh, you know, instead of the humans and the Cylons trying to defeat each other on Battlestar as it's, you know, flying a clock across space, um, trying to get back to Earth, this is you're probably just trying to survive the ship oh, wow. <laughs> as uh, as tentacles are coming out of, of the water and all sorts of things. Um, from the looks of it uh, that we've got, there are definitely the different spaces on the ship where you get to perform specific actions, just like in the Battlestar game. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also plenty of spaces outside of the ship for the monsters and hopefully not the, uh, you know, folks who are on board the ship. Um, I don't I don't think anybody wants to go sinking. Um, but that's like, oh, my gosh, those the Battlestar game was a ton of fun. Yeah, I played it, it was. so many times. I only got um, to play it once. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, there were certain expansions. There was one in particular, and I think it was the the uh, it added the Cylon base ship. And so basically in in Battlestar, right, if you're a Cylon, you're trying to pretend that you're a human for as long as possible, because if you get outed as a Cylon, you get to still play, but your options are limited um, in uh, when you add the Cylon base star like cool. Yeah. OK, I'm a Cylon. I'm going to go be reborn on the base ship and I'm going to mess people up for the rest of the game. Like it is a ton of fun. Um, so maybe this game will get expansions. I don't know. I don't know if you get to play the 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 under deep world of the Cthulhu. Right, right. Folks, but yeah, uh, it could be fun. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty jazzed about it for the minis alone. I, you know, I love minis. Oh, yeah. Fantastic minis. Fantasy Flight does good minis. Um, it's true. But you know, here's the thing: is I know Cthulhu monsters are in their hip, but I think it's going to be the Summer of Vampires and Renegade Game Studios is right there with Come me. Come on, <laughs> uh, they're, they're, the, the game called The Hunger is uh, available for pre-order. This is going to be uh, available in September. Um, vampire. So, so here's is so vampires awake from their torpor as eternal roses are blooming. You have until sunrise to run. Uh, run to the labyrinth and pick the most beautiful bloom hunting for humans on your way tempting familiars into helping you and increasing your power to become the most notorious vampire <laughs> wow I'm, I'm pretty into it wow. uh, you can download the rule book now uh, the hunger is uh, plays for two to six players and it lasts about 60 minutes um, which I think that's that's kind of a good range for a game um, I don't mm -hmm. There's very few times now that I want to play a game longer than an hour, uh -huh. uh, but yeah. So Reasonable. I mean, this, this looks fun, and it's Renegade Studios. They do good. It's uh, fifty bucks. Has a lot of really cool pieces. Um, if you order it, if pre-orders get uh, six variant player sheets, so like different art and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks good. I'm into it. Cool, cool, cool. 
Well, uh, if you, like me, uh, prefer to be on the side of the hunters, um, because uh, when I think of vampires, I watch Blade. Um, Blade <laughs> 3 specifically. <laughs> um, you might be interested in a Kickstarter that is going on right now and will be going on for 17 more days. Um, it is uh, Heliana's Guide to Monster Hunting. It's a supplement for D&D, 5th Ed. And uh, I don't know, if you love The Witcher, this is a book for you. It is all about... Um, creating this 300 page book that will give you specifically monster hunting style adventures um tracking these creatures like finding the signs you need in order to find their lairs huge monsters built in a boss battle format that has like usually three phases to make it just these epic ridiculous fights um and then afterwards, of course, you know, taking those monsters and harvesting the components that you might need to create the magic items that you want, um, uh, living items. They talk about a sword in here and other magic items that when you defeat certain monsters will level up and become more powerful guides to that kind of game. Um, I love the idea of Monster of the Week style gaming, and yeah. this is just making it better in D&D &D because it gives you those goals and those options that you want from like The Witcher, from Monster Hunter World, or or any game like that. Um, I am not alone in this because this has already almost hit a million dollars. I mean, it's doing great. There's uh, almost 900 backers. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want this book, the PDF is $25. Um, the actual physical copy gets you 50. And then there are, of course, tons and tons of add-ons, you know, um, special play mats, special styles for the book, pins, um, dice, you know, whatever else you want from one of these um, huge D&D Kickstarters. Nice. So I, I recommend checking it out. I think this is a cool game style. And I'm certainly at le the very least going to get this at the $25 level. Nice. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of weird games that... Well, weird games too, but the the company weird games W Y R D games, and they put oh. out uh, they tend to put out a little bit creepier stuff, a little bit spookier stuff, and and while this isn't specifically vampires, there could be vampires. Uh, <laughs> there's a game coming in fall called uh, Vagrant Song, and okay. Vagrant Song is a two to four player campaign game that takes place on a haunted train. Um, they say that, uh, they are taking heavy inspiration from American folklore, folk songs, and, you know, like folksy ghost stories, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a fully, uh, cooperative boss battler. You and your friends will take on the roles of, uh, vagrants who are trying to escape this ghostly train. You will have to work together to face your feels, fears, reveal <laughs> the mystery behind the silver ferryman, and <laughs> devise a plan on how to escape it. Wow. I'm pretty excited about this so um you know and it, it it's it i i like the game board and i'm gonna do that thing where i pull pull an image onto the screen so everyone can see it again uh just because i think this game board looks fantastic let's find it there it is we'll just toss it right up here uh, i yeah, I, right? I love the fact that it's longer than a normal game board and it does look like a train there's all kinds of cool bits and stuff to check out mm -hmm. as well as some minis yeah so i'm i'm into this it looks like fun i'm excited for it very cool. I like that, especially that longer board. Um, yeah. you know, train maps are always, always intriguing. I like that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. You got to go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's see here. Uh, what else is, what else do we got in the news? Anything? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I got a small one and a big one. Um, all Small right. one, real quick, just to chat. We've learned a little bit more about the Magic the Gathering stuff. Go, there's so many shenanigans going on with Magic the Gathering right now, right? It's from yeah. from crossover books to the Forgotten Realms specific campaign. Um, we uh, we're learning a little bit more about the uh, the Gathering universes or the universes beyond, right? Mm -hmm. um, adding stuff like like you were saying, Warhammer or um, Stranger Things, D and or excuse me, Magic the Gathering sets. Yeah. Um, and uh, they let us know in here through a couple of updates recently that uh, they, they plan to do this in the form of a secret lair, which which feels a lot less like a collectible card game, more like a living card game almost. Yeah. Like it's a smaller set of cards. They have more interesting mechanics that work together really well. And they're not actually meant to be played with the rest of Magic. Um, they will be updating the list and, and starting to come out with... Um, I think the reveal I saw was that they were going to start re releasing some of these cards in a more magic friendly format um, when they'll be added to 
the uh, the list, which is their curated curated collection of cards um, that end up in the the boosters and things like that. So nice. um, you'll be able to find them in the future normally um, in regular boosters, or you can get them in this special like secret layer format. Oh, that's so cool! I'm I I I I've been really getting into Magic lately, um, online. Uh, you know, on the uh, uh, in Magic: The Gathering Arena. So mm -hmm. I hope some of these cards come there because it'd be fun to play with those. But I, yeah. I, I can't say that I'm going to go out and buy them because I'm not a, a a cardboard Magic player. But if you are, um, they look they look really good. I I love the art. Um, yeah, and yeah. also the Walking Dead was the other one that you didn't mention that I heard is coming up. Oh, that's right. I think would be a ton of fun to have some Magic cards for the Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. um, are we? I I, I think uh, I think now we're going to dig in, start digging into D and D for a little bit. Uh, we have some D and D news. Uh, the first one I'm gonna I'm gonna kick us off with is uh, expanding Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so the idea is that they used to D and D used to have other companies handle the translations for their books. It was expensive. It was hard to do. It was hard to get those books. The books were expensive. So uh, D and D is taking it over now, and they are going to be. Um, you know, working to make uh, D and D as successful in other languages as it is in English, so they're hiring dedicated team members to work on these products. Uh, they're investigating new printing and production. They're un undertaking huge translation tasks and reviews of existing content. Um, mm -hmm. New, uh, all kinds of stuff. They're doing so many stuff. They're working with local teams in Europe and Latin America to get these products into the hands of fans. So um, yeah, no, it's it's super great. Uh, so starting in September, they're going to be launching the first products, the, uh, the three core rule books, um, in uh, four new languages, and that's wow. that's super cool to get uh, D and D across the world. So absolutely, and it's good that they're just doing it and making it their job to do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I think it's great. I know, uh, and actually, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have Teos on. Uh, Teos is 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 from Colombia, and so he grew up like having to translate, um, you know, translate yeah for himself. So, um, you know, this this is going to be pretty exciting and pretty fun news. Absolutely, that'll be fun to talk about. <laughs> All right, so uh, should we talk about the celebration thing? Oh, we should. Oh my gosh. Oh, folks, folks, um, it was recently my birthday and on my birthday, this Dungeon Master Challenge was dropped. <laughs> yeah. Um, as part of the upcoming D&D celebration for 2021 um, that G4 is going to be putting on um, in the lead up, they are announcing this Dungeon Master Challenge where um, there is a huge open call. We'll talk about that as you people get in and write different things according to the very specific standards that they have described for this competition. Mm -hmm. In the end, 10 Dungeon Masters will be chosen to take place in the competition, um, a few of them falling out round by round until they reach the final winner, the, the, <laughs> who will be named D&D's Best DM. <laughs> you 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 entered a similar contest like this for Paizo, didn't you? Yeah. So yeah, this this is very similar. Very similar. So what was that experience like in it, it was it was it fun? Is this something that we that I should be trying to do that that you're going to do that you know, just to even just throw your feet into it? <laughs> yes. Yes. Right, Everybody should be doing this. Um yeah, the the Paizo one was RPG Superstar and mm -hmm. uh it also featured an open call like this one. So it was just anyone who wanted to, right? Who knew about this project could write something for it. Um, you send it in, it is judged by the folks. I think RPG Superstar, there was a public voting component because it got mm -hmm. so large. Yeah. Um, but that also started with writing a magic item, which is not huge. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you could do that in like 250 words and that that's a huge item. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's talk um, about this a little bit. So first let's, before we get into the rules, so we'll look at stage mm -hmm. one, which is the open submission. So yes. uh, you have till, uh, you have until, what is it? Uh, the 17th or the 20th, uh, right. 12 p.m. PM on, the, uh, on the 20th to get it in. Then mm -hmm. stage two is the dungeon master challenge where 10 finalists yeah will uh, be on D&D Live, and they will be DMing for a judge, right? Oh, no, I missed that up. Open stage, D&D Live. Uh, there they will compete a series of weekly challenges. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and then right. uh, and then the final stage is where the three final contestants uh, 
go to a final challenge on September 2nd. And yeah, uh, yeah it'll be it'll be right. pretty interesting. This is wild because in RPG Superstar, it was very focused, right? The, the first round was you write a magic item. The second round was you write a creature. The third round was you write an encounter. And it got bigger and bigger because the eventual goal was to find people who could write an entire adventure module. Yeah. Um, we don't know what the rounds are going to be like in this no. one. Um, uh, we find out on the 17th of June is when they will announce what the parameters are for the first submission. Mm -hmm. um, there are some some uh, some guidelines here in the rules, but we still don't know what's happening yet. Um, uh, definitely, there are some some entry requirements. You cannot work for Wizards or be one of their contractors mm -hmm. to get in on this, um, but anyone else can. Um, I think it's fantastic. I think based on what i've read that the the intro is going to be cut here it is yeah stage one open submission um entries may not exceed one thousand words so yeah. one thousand words is is moving into the range of like a one page dungeon or mm -hmm. one uh major encounter something like that like that's yeah. that's a chunk of words and that i is. do not see thousands of people entering this competition because of it um it's definitely not come up with a you know a name and a little bit like you have to get in here and uh, based on my experience in RPG Superstar, it's going to, you know, the better you can hit like the D&D format when the judges read it and they're used to reading D&D books. If your format is like all over the place or the ideas you come up with are uh, a little outside of the bounds, uh, that might be tougher to judge. So yeah. um, the folks who are going to get in here are folks who are, uh, I don't, gosh, good at writing these things, yeah. right? Oh, there it is. The methodology. Mm -hmm. I think this is this is going to be also very important to remember is that you're going to want to adhere to the rules from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Chapter Tool, the Dungeon Master's Tools. So that may yep. give you some clues. Uh, we already have clues as far as the, uh, you know, the thousand words, right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's in, in, in how, how well you incorporate existing lore slash canon. So I think that's mm -hmm. that's that's stage one. Uh, stage yep. two, here's the little bit of information there. Um, but then stage uh, stage two is also has the Dungeon Master Challenge. And uh, we don't know what that's going to be. And, uh, you know, in, in this, uh, a panel of three judges will be assigned to assess entry awards based on the following criteria, right? And this is one of those ones where, this is where I saw entry may not exceed a thousand words. So that's yeah. good to know. And then, uh, yes, final stage. Final stage is three contestants. We'll each uh, be the dungeon master for a panel of three judges for a recorded and or live stream session to be broadcast by wizards. Um, yeah, so these are all really cool things. Um, if anyone in the chat is is, is going to be joining in on this, let us know. Uh, you know, type a one in the chat or something, an explanation point. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it's it's this is going to be be a ton of fun. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, uh, jumping into it. Yeah. I, I really want to see the, uh, the 10, right. I want to see what they've written and I hope that they release everything, right. That was a big deal was not just seeing who made it through because, you know, we don't know the, the DM writing community or whatever out there in the world, but, um, reading their entries and starting to become fans of them. I mean, that's another big deal with with a, with a competition like this is, you know, you see someone's encounter and you're like, that's good writing. I like that. I'm interested. I want to see what you do in the next phase. I mean, this, this is a reality show. That's why we watch reality shows, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, it totally is. Yeah. And I, I do like that they are going to be getting points and they are like, a, like they said, eliminating either one or two people, every one of those DM challenges, whoever has the lowest point total at those points, yeah. at those moments, I suppose. So yeah. Yeah. And this, uh, in Tempest, yeah. Tempest, Emma uh, brought up in chat. They they said they can write, but they can't DM. So no experience there. And you know, and 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 I do think that's why this one is not so much the RPG superstar and more of the best mm -hmm. DM challenge because DMing is going to be a uh, important uh, portion of that. Um, but I do, with all this in mind, I do think uh, we're going to be talking to some of our guests, including uh, one of our fantastic guests next week, which is uh, Mr. Sean Merwin. Uh, we're going to be chatting to him about some adventure design and some DMing tips and that type of stuff. So definitely, uh, Tempest Thema, come back, uh, check it out, see what Sean has to say. Mm -hmm. He has a lot of experience talking uh, or playing, helping new players run, helping players run, running an organized play. So 
right? This this first entry, the open submission is written. So, yeah. you know, get in on it. And the other thing about it, which I, I highly recommend, right? When when I, oh my gosh, the first time I did RPG Superstar, I didn't know what the heck I was doing at all. <laughs> I right. wrote an object and it did not make it even through the first round. The second time I entered, I did get in. And I, I remember getting the feedback from the judges and being like, oh, this is okay. Okay. I see what's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, I even got to the the round where you wrote an encounter and very, very clearly, like one of the things I wrote, I remember the feedback really specifically was like, this isn't something that we we try to do in um, in some of our adventures. You know, we want more breadth here. We want more stuff going on. And that really helped me think about how I want to write adventures uh, mm -hmm. and encounters. You know, it was a little, it was a little too simple. It was a cool location. And then the encounter was not that exciting. So yeah. um, it was how to balance that a little more. I loved it. It was great. So um being part of it, like joining the community, seeing what people and the judges say about other people's work, like makes you better at doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I really recommend it. Yeah. Oh man. Um, oh, look at that time. Look at that timer click down. That's right. the moment they will release the information. Uh, everything is due on the 20th, which will be our next show. I mean, so this mm -hmm. open submission is happening this week, this coming week. <laughs> yeah. All right. Ooh. Oh, man. All right. Well, that's that's the news. News took a little bit longer today than it normally does because of some of the big news that was coming specifically, specifically oh, this. But uh, are we shaking now? Are you are you ready to uh, to get some Scooby snacks? Oh, I am. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's pop on over here. So uh, I didn't get a chance to play this. You did. Um, this is a Scooby Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. Um, and this game is from the op and yes yeah so so tell us a little bit more about this game i i'm pretty yeah. i i'm pretty excited about the style of game but you you talk <laughs> a little bit more about it i am too um this is the latest in the coded chronicles game series by the op um i'm excited by these these are these are meant to be games like escape room style games right mm -hmm. so you there's a mystery you're trying to solve it um oh my gosh the theme song was almost there in my head uh, there's a mystery to solve in Scooby-Doo. Is it ready for you? Okay. All right. Anyway, um, I don't have it. Um, but I this game brought it all home for me. Like this felt like a Scooby-Doo game. Yeah. It was not just an escape room thing with stuff going on. There were classic moments from D or from a Scooby-Doo in here that I just I loved. Um, this is kind of the the introduction. This is what you get in the box. You have a whole mm -hmm. bunch of books. You get five standees, one for each character. Um, you got a bunch of secret envelopes in here. You got a big deck of cards. Um, and you also have some map tiles. That's basically the whole game. And as you are playing, you're going to be reading entries in these books that tell you to put out certain map tiles, put certain people on those map tiles, you know, flip over certain cards, stuff like that. Um, throughout this game, you are welcome to do anything as long as the rules say that you can. So if I'm starting, this is like the foyer tile. I'm here and Velma is the only person in here. That means Velma's ability is to research things. So I can do some research on the candies on the table for 201. Um, I can't eat those candies because Shaggy's the one who eats things. And Shaggy is not in the room right now. <laughs> uh, I also, I can't smell them. I can't use them and I can't investigate them because uh, they all have different, you know, skills. Um, and this was great. Basically, um, you you move through right you are investigating reading these these entries and they tell you more um this one starts with just velma right something happens right and in the read me first it tells you exactly which of these books to get into first it gives you the basic scenario in this one you are um the the mystery machine breaks down you go to the nearby house um and uh, it's haunted. The butler here lets you in and uh, as you all run in something spooky happens and only velma uh, is available in the first round here in the foyer. So trying to get out of it. Um, this is uh, how the game works, the entire thing. If uh, if I want Fred here to talk to the butler, then I need to look up entry 5,423, which is in the Fred book. Um, I flip to that and it tells me what's going on. Every card has a different number on it. Um, all the rooms have different numbers all over them. And you're just trying to keep track of the whole thing. Is, um, is there a mechanic for running in one door on a side of the hall and coming out the other door on the opposite side? <laughs> there was not. No, no. But um, those sorts of things happened quite a bit, actually. Like, oh. um, uh, 
I wouldn't say that specifically, but there were moments when the team gets broken up. Like you find other people, like just in the, co- you know, like in the cartoon, you meet up. Oh, there's Fred. Fred's tied up. Oh no, there's uh, there's Velma. Velma's over there. Um, there's Shaggy. Shaggy is trapped in a uh, piano or something. Like, <laughs> there's all sorts of just like wacky things. Um, and I, I really, I really liked it. Like it felt like a Scooby-Doo adventure. Um, Inside the envelopes, there's all sorts of things. Like this one was the skeleton key. It gave you like some Tetris pieces, some Tetrominoes um, that you might have to build in order to get through certain doors in the game, stuff like that. Um, it was just great. I mean, yeah, right? <laughs> That's uh, it's where you hide. It's just where yeah, you hide. Dom, Dom is letting us know he did get trapped in pianos a lot, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so you didn't have the whole team every time or mm-hmm. at, in every moment, right? And certain entries would be like, oh, <laughs> zoinks, you are <laughs> like, these people are, they're, they're out of the room now, or you see something creepy and everybody runs and now you're just playing, you know, Fred and Shaggy and you're in the kitchen now, something like that. Nice. Um, so it felt like, you know, it felt like Clue a little bit with that people moving around. Um, in this one, you were specifically meeting people. And of course, in every Scooby-Doo story we know what happens when we meet a group of people right yeah. one of them did it yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so like there's there's all these story nodes that are like moving you around and, and letting you investigate this whole place but in the back of your mind it's still like one of these people this this place isn't haunted it's one of these people right um which it was just it was a ton of fun to like to know that to figure it out as i was going as i was working my way through nice. um I don't remember the rest of the pictures are. I grabbed a couple of pictures here from um, uh, Board Game Geek just because I wanted a few extra samples. Uh, you get your weapons here, things like that. They're not really weapons. They're just things that will let you do certain things that you might need in the game. Um, there were codes. There was there was there was all sorts of good stuff in here. Um, I will say, yeah, that nothing in here puzzle wise is uh, is beyond. Um, uh, I mean, you know, when when you look at a puzzle game or an escape room game, you're like, eh, I don't know if I can do that. This one's going to be fine. <laughs> There's okay. nothing in here that is too difficult uh, at all. Um, uh, I will say, actually, that there's some things that they provide you that expect you to need hints um, and to do oh. certain things. Um, I found out that uh, I got in trouble a couple times. I lost some Scooby snacks. Um because I saw a puzzle and I was like, I know how to solve this puzzle. And then I solved it. But like the cards that you get when you need hints or when you investigate a little more were really important. Like they, oh. those were useful. And so I got <laughs> penalized for not accessing them. Um, and the game had a couple of those moments, like because you have five characters, yeah. when you see the bowl of candies on the table, you're like, well, I'm just going to have Shaggy eat them. Uh, right. Um I don't have, you know, Scooby come over and smell the bowl afterwards or some investigation, but sometimes those things lead to clues. So you really want to use all the books and have all your characters available to you so you can search everything all the time um, to get all the cards you might need to solve the biggest puzzles and figure out exactly who who did it, who right. who done did it, who's the haunter. So uh, um, tell me about replayability. Zero. Zero. <laughs> no, okay. this this is this is a game where mm-hmm. when you are done with it, you pack it back up and you can pack it back up. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, the secret envelopes are taped shut, so just retape them, you yeah. know, um, and then give it to someone else. Okay, so that it, they so, can have the adventure. So <laughs> similar to um, The Shining. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. There is just one story in there. Once you've mm-hmm. got it, you've got it. But the good news about these games is um, you can play them with a lot of people. There's no limit. Uh, you're just kind of reading the books and, and deciding what to do as a group. Uh, so it's good for solo. It's good for a bunch. Um, and unlike some of the escape room games, you never have to tear anything up. That's so that's good. I you know perfectly I, replayable by someone else. <laughs> exactly. I I I greatly dislike games where you have to destroy something, which is why I've never gotten into the legacy games. Although. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of tempted because I don't replay games that much, but there's still yeah. something about it that like, uh, that I hate. And I, and I remember there was one, it was, we'll look back at clue, right? Clue. Yeah. Like you had those stupid pads and you would, you know, you would check your stuff off and you'd rip it off and throw it away. And, and that would be it, right? There would be, you'd be done right. Eventually. Mm-hmm. And right. <laughs> I, I, I disliked that there was a finite amount of times that I could play a game even though I don't, I'm not going to play it the 
50, 60 times. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I totally understand what you mean. Like those, they just, you see it and you're like, this game has an expiration date. And I mean, a lot of games do. We just don't realize it because we we only play it three times and then it's yeah. two years later and we're not going to go back to it, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, but it tells you right in advance that this will be a limited experience. So enjoy it while you can. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Cool. I, I really thought this was fun. And if you are looking to get into this kind of game and the shining was a little bit too like, okay, that's, that's spooky. Um, this one's just fun. It's just fun. It's silly. It's got Scooby-Doo moments in it. And uh, it, it really felt like the writers did a lot of good dialogue in there. Like when you read the Velma book, you get Velma quotes, you know, when you read the Scooby book, you get ridiculous things. <laughs> um, so I think you should check it out. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so overall, you like this game, you like the style of game. Do you have any more of these reviews for this style of game coming up, or are we are we settled for now? Uh, I think we're settled. I think these are the only two that are out by the op right now. Okay. Um, uh, I, I love escape room games, so I may check out a couple other ones. Um, I have a few around here, I'm sure. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think at this point, let's go ahead and move on to our next subject of the day. This is going to be Let's kind of brief. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is the College of Dad. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so this this started. I saw a somebody tweeted uh, uh, that there should be a a Bard College that's just uh, spawned around dad jokes. So mm -hmm. you know your uh, your cantrip, uh, vicious mockery is just bad dad jokes. And your your yeah. inspiration <laughs> is just like uh, is 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 like a dad patting you on the back and say get her done right mm -hmm. so so I thought it would be hilarious to design a subclass for the bard in uh in celebration of the upcoming Father's Day College <laughs> of Dad uh this is this is I think version two I think we're actually on mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> I, th I, I think we're actually on ver version three. Wait, <laughs> there are good dad jokes, says are there? Penguin Witch are there? Doctor. It's, like, eh, it's debatable. Um, right. But, you know, so it's just kind of fun. Uh, we'll we'll make sure and make this available. <laughs> oh, that's good. I like this. DJ regular. You got this, champ. Players granted advantage. Right. And yeah. I mean, you can, you can run that. That can be the way Bardic... Uh inspiration works for you and it's fantastic right exactly. but when you wrote this i got really excited because it's got little bits in here that just dig into it um, yeah uh so so not, we'll start with see. the bonus proficiencies <laughs> yeah uh, when you join the college dad you gain proficiencies with cook utensils land vehicles and water vehicles because dad is always driving and dad is always <laughs> at the grill so <laughs> and right, i don't know when when i put this together i, I had this feeling like it reminded me of of um onward so much so that's why like the, the onward dad stuff is yeah, in here yeah no, uh, okay. made me laugh <laughs> um, yeah very helpful you gotta have some tools gotta have some stuff to drive right yeah Sounds exactly good. uh and then at third level you gain the uh you gain the ability let me help you with that so there's nothing dads like more than than, <laughs> than helping and <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and helping you learn new things and, you know, and, and dads are always seem to be a jack of all trades. So, uh, as an action, you can add a, uh, your proficiency bonus to any skill in which you, uh, are, uh, are not already proficient for 10 minutes. Additionally, if you help someone with this new skill and they succeed on their check, the outcome is remarkably successful. And, uh, through the glow of accomplishment, you both gain, uh, 1d4 plus your charisma modifier hit points right and, and, and that's just like you know it's not a lot of hit points it's just mm -hmm. it's fun right. um so this yeah. one I, I totally see it as like oh so you're trying to study this arcane ritual huh and like glasses on well i, I did a little bit of study of that myself uh -huh. back in the yeah. day well let me mm -hmm. let me take a look <laughs> yeah you and know, then the, when it works, you both get hit points. <laughs> yeah, the, the the one that came to my head, like I mean, like I could imagine a dad walking up to a wagon wheel and seeing it's broken, say, "Come here, sport. Let me show you how to change a wagon wheel." <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I like that ability. Very fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then at sixth level, you got this sports. Um, 
<laughs> you get to, you know, encourage your, your companions to be their very best. As a bonus action, you call out to, you know, any creature who can hear you. You try to encourage them and they get a choice of how they want to be encouraged mm -hmm. here. Um, whether that's, oh, I've got a thing that's affecting me. So you got this sport. I'm going to make a saving throw to try and, you know, not be grappled or not have be poisoned or whatever else. You know, you got this. Mm -hmm. Um immediately heal a couple hit points um a d6 plus your charisma modifier little heal that's good um or you know just make an instant single melee or ranged attack or cast a cantrip yeah um i love those abilities right they're just small they're quick it's just you as a little bonus like get out there you can do it <laughs> <laughs> oh man and then and then you know when you when you're nearing those epic levels your 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 progeny has grown up they have learned so much and, and as a dad, you're so proud, and I'm so proud of you, is what they gain at 14th level. Uh, and then as a, bo <laughs> as a bonus action, you tell one creature uh, how proud of them you are, and that creature may immediately spend a number of hit dice, uh, or any number of hit dice to regain hit points, and they gain bonus on their next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw equal to your charisma modifier. Um, yeah. yeah, it's 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 pretty great. Um, mm -hmm. the pride in your voice speaks to the hearts, uh, allowing this feature to target creatures who are oh. sleeping or <laughs> unconscious and they immediately wake up unless they are under the effect of a magical slumber and you can right. use this, uh, ability, uh, once at the, uh, once during a short rest or long rest once per long rest. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Cause that's, that's basically, that's a revival spell. You know, if yeah. you were unconscious, you've been dropped. Well, you can almost heal. I mean, if you're rolling as many hit dice as you've got, you could, I mean, could heal all the way back to full. It's yeah. unlikely, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's yeah. a that's a big move, which I like a lot. Like yeah. a good fourteen level power. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna make sure and toss this up on the Discord. Uh, we'll try to get reversion three up there, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. Have fun with it. Play play around on Dad's Day. Let us know if you have any suggestions on on if things are out of balance, and uh, we'll play around with that. Because it's <laughs> why? Because it's fun, and that's uh, right. You know, and 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 colleges are fun to write. So. All right. Now, speaking of uh, subclasses, are we ready to really get into it? Really get nerdy with it? Oh, man, we're diving deep into D&D &D today. Very deep. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. All right. All right. So, so here we are. Mages of Strixhaven. So this is a playtest document from uh, Wizards of the Coast. It's the Unearthed Arcana. Um, and this is uh, allows you. This is a. These are subclasses that allow you to play a mage associated with one of the five colleges of Strixhaven. Um. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, yeah. that's that's it. Well, <laughs> tell me a little bit. So, I mean, this mm -hmm. is a, a magic crossover book. Um, it is. And I did not play the Strixhaven set. So, so we talked about this a little bit last time. But, but what is Strixhaven like? Uh, okay. So, Strixhaven is a school of school for mages, and there are five different houses, and each of the houses are a mixture of two colors. So, um, you know, and, and I, I'll probably get this wrong, but I think Quandrix is like green and blue. Silver Quill is blue and white. Witherbloom is green and black. Uh, okay. per, Perasmi, per, per, I can't remember. That's the one that I tend to play, which is red mm. and blue. Um, and, okay. and, and yeah, and there, there's all these different colleges and um, essentially you are you know your 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 cards are have different things like magecraft and 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 learning and cool sorcery stuff um yeah and it's pretty flavorful it's it's a ton of fun to play there's there's a lot of really cool cards that have to do with being mm -hmm. on campus i like this okay so this is these are opposing colors right it's on the, yeah. the magic color wheel these aren't neighbors they're they're enemies um cool okay that that does make it very interesting for me already <laughs> very yeah. ravnica here i'm in yeah yeah um, all right so let's let's kick it off right so the first one we're gonna look right. at is the mage of lore hold and i i think there's there's a big deal right here at the very start which mm -hmm. is uh they decided these subclasses were not going to be specific to a class um because that, otherwise you everyone would be a wizard and that doesn't work um as yeah. long as you are a spell caster druids in here clerics not um you can take some of these. So mm -hmm. the Mage of Lorehold here, um, if you are a bard, a warlock, or a wizard, you can take 
this subclass. Uh, that does mean a couple things. That means the abilities are not tied to your specific level. They are a list of options. And whenever you would get a subclass feature, you can choose anything of that level or less mm -hmm. uh, in this list. Yeah, uh, and I and I think that's pretty interesting. Um, I would have to look at the Bard, the Warlock, and the Wizard and see when they get... Uh, oh, interesting. See when they get all these things. Somebody already did this. <laughs> so... So if if you were to if you were to take a class, which one maximizes Mage of Lorehold, and which one actually yeah. is hurt by taking it? Yeah, and in in this case, right, um, a lot of the classes are pretty similar, right? Druids, warlocks, and wizards all get they get their first abilities either at first, second, or third. Actually, yeah, first, second, or third level, mm -hmm. as all characters do. Um, every class gets a feature at sixth level. Every class gets a feature at 14th level, but not all of them get one at 10th. So actually, if you were a bard here, you get one fewer option than everybody else. Um, uh, whereas our warlocks and wizards are going to be able to, to max this out pretty well and get all of the abilities that you see. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, it makes sense that the wizard's good. So I'm right. that. All right. All right. So what do they get at first level or, you know, at the earliest stage of their lore hold mm -hmm. career? Um, let's see. Our lore hold spells, uh, gaining yep. the sacred flame spell, comprehend languages, and then this this cool little spell list mm -hmm. um, that you get to add. And these are these are pretty solid lore based spells. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> although I know we got a kitty now. Um I also love that the fifth level spells here are speak with dead and spirit guardians, right? Mm -hmm. There is this, this, this cool ghostly aura to this class that I like a lot. Yeah. And you know, the learning to cantrip sacred flame is pretty powerful. Um, you know, that's a free bonus cantrip and sacred flame is a pretty solid cantrip all around. So um, already I, I feel like this is, this is a solid, um, solid subclass. So let's talk about the Ancient Companion. So Here with the go. Ancient Companion, you learn to call out spirits, ancient dead around the house, and uh, or, or, and you're able to just like, you know, use the remnants of an old statue or something and turn it to life. Um, so whenever you finish a short or long rest, you can call forth and bond with one such spirit who inhabits a medium freestanding statue within 10 feet of you, serve as your Ancient Companion. So uh, let's take a... <laughs> let's 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 take a yeah. quick quick look at at the way this kind of breaks down. So, um, you it's using the same kind of format that you saw in in other more recent books, specifically um, Tasha's. Uh, the yeah. way that you build your companion. So I don't think it's it's hugely going to be. It's not going to be hugely different. Um, it does have an attack that's Spirit Strike, which is it, it looks pretty solid. Um, yeah. But what's kind of neat is I think what this one is the healer's light. So um, if you choose the healer ver variation of the companion, as far as I understand, uh, the, cam uh, uh, the companion chooses a creature within 15 feet of itself and flares in with invigorating light. The creature gains 1d8 uh, proficiency bonus temporary hit points. And I like that a lot. That's that's quite a number. Sorry about the tentacles here. Um, that's a that's a good number of temporary hit points to get. That's a lot yeah. more than many many features. So I yeah. like that. And that's that's pretty strong. Um, mm -hmm. But is it yeah. overly strong? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, uh, <laughs> our artificer is kind of the top end on that one. Um, yeah. So this is fine, I think. Um, and if you choose that, you're missing out on things like sages' counsel, so getting mm -hmm. uh, bonuses on your intelligence and wisdom checks. Yeah. Um, or uh, what else? Oh, some extra armor class, I think. So not too different, depending on which kind of, of friend you would like to find. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I, yeah, I, I focused on the healer's light because that would be it's the so one good. that I would choose all the time. Um, I know there's the warrior one that has warrior's protection as a reaction, mm -hmm. which, is, which is pretty good too. But yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm more into the healer. So yeah, uh, fair right. enough. Lessons of um, the past. Uh, so the, everybody gets this at six level because all classes get a six level ability. Mm -hmm. um, when you bond with your companion, the choice you make uh, gives you another ability. Um, 
So if you choose healer, and this, this would be pretty finicky, I think, your hit point maximum increases by an amount equal to your level in this class. So six, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you gain that many hit points. Uh, whenever you regain hit points from a spell, you heal even better. So okay. you become easy to heal and you have more hit points. You don't, um, you don't heal better right other people better you just heal yourself better yeah um okay not bad um the sage gives you advantage on ability checks using um you know sagey things arcana history nature religion um once per turn when you deal damage to a creature with a spell of first level or higher you can do an extra ex extra excuse me 1d8 force damage okay cool yeah yep yeah, all right uh, yeah, and he, just take a quick look at the warrior. Uh, if you use your action to cast a cantrip, you can make a one-handed uh, weapon attack as part of that action. If the weapon attack hits, the target uh, takes an additional 1d8 radiant damage. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Wow. I, I really like that because now I'm playing, right? I'm playing a wizard who is out here probably, um, I'd say, with a bow. Right. Yeah. I've got an, an ancient companion running around, like punching things, this big statue. Mm -hmm. I'm blasting cantrips. And when I hit, I get to also fire my bow. And if it hits, it will do an extra D8 points of damage. That's how I, I'm reading that. When ability. you cast it, you don't even have to hit. Oh, wow. Yeah. You don't even have to hit. So you're basically getting double strike at that point, you know? Um, probably nine. I mean, at six levels. So your cantrips are leveled up. They're doing, you know, two dice of damage or whatever else. And your weapon is, you know, fine probably not great but well I another mean, attack is gone but let's let's take a look though right uh so you're a blade lock right oh oh there we go all right yeah. yeah so 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 i'm now i'm now i'm thinking about a little bit of balance right so let's take bar bard and ward lock right we got the sword bard we got the uh bard lock or not the bard lock the uh sword lock uh if either of those take warrior uh that's going to be a huge boon for them yeah uh if yeah. any of them take healer that's going to be good for anyone really across the board just in general i think it's it's a solid survival i think sage is the weakest I agree. except for you know that d8 force force is great but i think mm -hmm. it's, it's it is the weakest and i think it would only it'll be primarily used as it's probably intended solely for um, you know, role play encounter style days. Right. Yes. Your your sage is this ancient spirit who is giving you advice all the yeah. time. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Um right. yeah. but it's not gonna have the damage output of these other two. Yeah, and and, and I and I it, I would almost go like I like the idea to sage, but I would almost go um giving a bonus to a D twenty roll and taking away mm -hmm. the uh, force damage, right? Because, you know, like if you could do add one d8 to any one, uh, you know, d20 roll per short rest, right? That's yeah. that's powerful, but I don't think it's overly powerful. I think it's it's enough to keep it where players will have to choose between the warrior and the healer, and really consider yeah. what's going to be most valuable for their you know their survival, their 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 experience. Um, and I like to d additional d8. Two to D twenty for the sage too, because then you can use that for skills. Yeah, so. absolutely. I feel like the warrior here is probably going to end up as a extra weapon attack as a bonus action, maybe mm -hmm. rather than just a free action. But yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I think that'll shift to bonus uh, because yeah, once you start thinking about the blade lock, um, you know, you're up close and you cast a cantrip. Oh. Yeah. Boom! You cast you you cast sword burst right. So then you know sword burst is a cantrip that has a free attack associated with it, and then you get another free attack. So that's yeah. you know a bajillion damage right there in one round. So I think yeah. the warrior is going to get trimmed a little bit. <laughs> what we're saying is play it right now. Play like get right. out there, get out now. there and do it. <laughs> uh, amazing! I love it because this this again this goes to only the bard, warlock, and wizard. So we're not talking about fighters or any. Oh my gosh, these are great fighters. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I guess in a sense we kind of need that because I expect that if you were playing in this world, you're not going to play a barbarian. You know, potentially right. we don't we don't really know what the rest of those classes are going to be like in this That's setting. That's true. Or if you want to play a spellcaster, so you need fighting prowess behind you. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I'll be interested to see how that plays out too. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, all right. War echoes. We didn't talk about talk about this at all. Um, 
by pulling from uh, the magic of the past, you can cause your opponent's old runes to resonate anew. So once per turn, when a creature you can see um, hits a target with an attack roll, you can use... It's a little small on my screen, sorry. Uh, use your reaction to force uh, the target to make a wisdom saving throw. Um, against your spell save DC on a failure, the target becomes vulnerable to the uh, damage uh, types of the attack. Um, and the vulnerability ends with the target's next turn. So That's brutal. That is, that is. brutal. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's double damage, right? Yep. So, and, and if, if you're getting hit with, um, I mean, there's no limits on this one, so it could be a sword. Yeah, <laughs> it's a slashing weapon. So now uh, all slashing weapons do double damage until the end of their next turn. Um, yeah, you don't you don't need a stunning monk around anymore. You no. know that's does it, just... <laughs> does it do damage double damage or one point five damage? I thought it was double. Oh, it might be. I'll, I'll have to I'll have to look. I don't it up. think we calculate one point five in this game. That's right. It must be double. <laughs> all right. Uh, yes. All right. Anyway, it's huge. Yeah. Can cause... you only do that once a day? No, <laughs> no, no. How often do you e get to do it? E equal to your proficiency bonus. So by the time you're level 10, we're talking, what, three to four times a day, mm -hmm. four times a day. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, let's let's look at this last one. Right. History's web. Wow. 14th level through steeping yourself in the chaotic whims of history. You learn how to briefly channel the wild nature of time itself. So this is a bonus action. You can enter a state of chronal chaos. Um, at the start of each of your subsequent turns while in this state, you gain one of the following benefits. Um, uh, it can either be luck. Um, whenever you make a saving throw against an effect that deals damage, you can roll a d6 and add that number to the total. Um, just dodge, dodge, dodge. Great. Resistance. You have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Uh, that's across the board, not magical or non-magical only. Mm -hmm. And swiftness, uh, your movement speed increases by 15 feet and you do not provoke opportunity attacks. This benefit lasts until the start of your next turn. You cannot choose the same benefit two rounds in a row. The chaotic state lasts up to one minute. Okay. And so, um, so you go into the chaotic state and then you can bounce between lucky, resistance, swiftness as bonus actions. Exactly. Okay. And then um, uh, let's see here. So you can't use it again until you finish a long rest unless you expend a spell slot of fourth level or higher to use it again. I mean, right. I, I do like that actually being able to expend stel a spell slot for that. That would be cool. Yeah. I mean, this is this is really strong. This is definitely this this class all on its own is like, you know, a Gish style, right? Yeah. Gish. Yeah. There we go. Yep. Um, your, your, your sword mage blade sorcerer i don't know whatever you want to call them <laughs> right right um and it's pretty good at it i think those abilities are awesome um yeah uh yeah the only one the, that i worry about is going to be the lessons of the past i think that's the one that's really we're going to see some revisions on everything else looks yeah. solid i don't think uh anything mm -hmm. else is too wild yeah in this one there there is a weird thing as well which is if you were playing a bard um you get the the intro level, you get the sixth level, and then you don't get another ability until 14th, and you will have to Oof. choose between the 10th and the 14th level abilities for this class, yeah. which is brutal. <laughs> yeah. Oof. Uh, I don't know which one of those I would pick, actually. Well, no, oh, let me think. Let me think. Nope, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't I think know the 14th one is a lot of fun, but that 10th level one is pretty powerful. Yeah. Oof. So. That's tough. That is tough. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Well, let's move on uh, to the Mage of the Prismari. What Prismari is the one that I like. Um, this is a, I got to say, if, if this is the book we're looking at so forth, this is a power creep book. Yeah. And probably is not going to be active in most campaigns. War Echoes for certain in there. It's just too much damage. It's so much damage. It is. Um, yeah. Penguin Witch Doctor of War Echoes for certain. Um, yeah. There's, 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 there, I, I, and we've discussed this before. I think power creep is valuable. I think it's good. I think it's something that we should definitely expect from RPGs. And, mm -hmm. um, I think it's good for the health of the hobby. Um, because I think so. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, eventually fifth edition is going to get to the point where it's, it, you know, they can't release anything new because everything's so powerful. And then we get sixth edition. And I know a lot of people bemoan that and, and groan it, but, I, I feel like, you know, if we want to keep getting D&D &D stuff, we want to keep playing these games, we want to keep 
you know, we want to keep Wizards in business. We want to keep Paizo yeah. in business. We want to keep uh, Renegade Games in business. We, we you know, we, we you know, yeah. all M Modifius, uh, uh, we want to keep all those people in business. So we're, we want them to make that power creep. So, so we have all that fun where we're playing these super powerful characters and it's time mm -hmm. for the new edition and we get to learn a new game and, and fall in love with its, its cool quirks. So that is true. I, I am just suggesting that if, if you were to play a college of lore hold character and I was playing a champion fighter. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's gonna, you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We know. All right. Absolutely. Mage of Prismari. Uh, we've got Druid, Sorcerer, and Wizard. And just based on their, their levels, these are pretty comparable. The Sorcerer mm -hmm. is in trouble later on, but we'll, we'll chat about that. But okay. Druids and Wizards have the exact same progression in terms of these features. Okay. All right. So uh, so at level one, uh, you get, or your first uh, thing, you get uh, creative skills. So you gain the proficiency of two of the following skills of your choice, acrobatics, athletics, nature, performance. Easy. I love it. I love that. Yeah, easy. I like giving I mean, skills. I like more skills. <laughs> all the skills. Uh, now, let's see here. So uh, you also get, um, at the same level, you get kinetic artistry. So yeah. uh, you can use dash as a bonus action, which I, I just wanted to point that out right away. That's I think it's super powerful whenever a monk mm -hmm. does it. I see, think it's super powerful when a rogue does it. I think it's great when anybody can do this. I, I already... I already enjoy kinetic artistry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then whenever you do that dash, uh -huh. you also get a benefit. Yeah. So let's start with a boreal sweep. So icy water swirls around you until the end of your turn. You can move across surfaces of water as if it were harmless as solid ground. I love that. Additionally, when you leave a space within uh, five feet of a creature, you can force that creature to make a strength saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failed save, the creature is knocked prone. A creature can be affected uh, by the. Uh, a creature can only be affected by the water once per each turn. I love Interesting. it. I love it. I like that ability. I would be curious. Um, this puts up a timing issue, right? Because whenever you leave uh, someone, you know, five feet away, they get an attack of opportunity. Which one of these should trigger first? Do they get knocked prone before they get to slap me, or is it moving away? Is what? Ugh. Um, they get knocked prone before they slap you because it's the moving away. It's the moving away that does that versus okay. Yep. Fair. <laughs> All so, right. Oh, but so actually they are both like... they are both when you leave a space. So yeah. uh I would that's gonna be one where the DM has to abdicate it, and I will always defer to the players. Yeah, we'll make it more fun instead of more penalizing. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so probably every time you were swooping away, you were knocking someone prone, they're getting disadvantaged to attack you on their attacks of opportunity. You don't have to disengage. Um mm -hmm. It's pretty nice. I will say though that you can do this as a bonus action. I don't. We haven't gotten to the next page, so I don't know the limits per day. But if there is limits per day, it uh, is your proficiency bonus. Oh, okay. Uh, and a get them back on a long rest. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think for a long rest, I, I I feel good about this. I would even you know give a bonus to AC or something, right? Like, I I think tossing a plus two to AC whenever you're getting attacked by attack opportunity with this power, I I don't think that would hurt it. I think that would well, make it more playable. Let's look at some of these other options. <laughs> oh, that's true. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, Scorching Whirl. Uh, flames wreathe your steps. Once before the end of your turn, you can force each creature within, a fi within five feet of you to make a dexterity saving throw against your spell save. On a failure, the creature takes fire damage equal to 1d4 plus your spell casting modifier. All right. Limited, but uh, it's a big group of folks. Mm -hmm. um, right. Um, it could be at any time during your movement, so it doesn't have to be immediate. It doesn't have to be at the start. You can get yourself into a cool position and do, you know, what what are we talking here? Like five, you know, seven damage, something like that. It's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. Um, and and it, yeah, actually, you're right. Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't think we need to give the bonus to Boreal Sweep just because you can leave squares adjacent to a creature while still staying adjacent to it. So right. you could weave around it, knock them prone. They get their opportunity attack as you leave their reach and go towards the next opponent. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. And if you are worried about it, you can take Thunderlight Jaunt, mm. right? 
you take on a nimble lightning form until the end of your turn you can move through the space of other creatures and you do not provoke opportunity attacks um if you end your turn inside a creature space you are pushed into the next unoccupied space so this is the one for uh, i'm gonna go where i want and no one can do anything about it yeah <laughs> Yeah, Which you would potentially get a bonus five feet to your speed too with it. Mm -hmm. I like yeah, that. Yeah, if you set it up right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So we got a lot of movement things in here. Definitely this is feeling like the monk or rogue option in this game. Yeah, yeah. So, it, you know, for this, if you're playing a, a druid, sorcerer, wizard, you know, a blade singer would be a ton of fun with this. Yeah. Um, None of the druids or sorcerers really stand out to me specifically for this, except the fact that, you know, some, some sorcerers deal with some of that elemental damage types. And I think that would be good there. Same thing with the druid. Okay. Um, okay. The kinetic artistry, like I would, have, I would have almost based on, based on what I know about the magic game and based on, you know, this bit, I would have almost dropped sor or wizard and gone bard. Um, but it is a wizard school. Yeah. I, I might've put bard in there just in general, but maybe not. All right. I believe, although I'd have to check, that all of them are wizard. Oh, that's yeah. not true. The last one is not wizards. Okay. But... Cool. Okay. All right. So uh, where are we at? We're at favored medium. Favored medium. Yes. Okay. So you've owned, you've, you've honed, there we go, your forms of elemental expression to best suit your ideas. Um, choose one of the following damage types, cold fire or lightning. You gain resistance to that. Bam. Um, additionally, whenever you cast a spell using a spell slot that deals the chosen damage type, you emit a spectacular aura, which extends five feet from you in every direction and lasts until the end of your next turn. While the aura is active, each creature of your choice has resistance to that damage type within the aura as you shape those like elemental medium around them. So you right. decide, you know what? I'm going to get resistance to fire. Cool. Whenever I cast a fire spell, the zone around me gets protected by fire elementals and everyone in here is now resistant to fire for a while. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's a cool. And then, you know, you take a long rest and you decide, nope, tomorrow's going to be a cold day instead. Yeah. I like that it lasts for the whole day and it's on a long rest. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Because it does but last. All day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I dig it. I think it's cool. Yeah. I like that power. I do too. It doesn't seem overpowered at the moment. Uh, it seems very useful. It does. Um, I like that. I do too. All right. Let's see. Uh, focused expression. Honing your talents, you skillfully infuse your uh, your motions with even more potent expressions of elemental might. Once per turn, you deal damage to at least one target. You gain a dis uh, uh, an additional effect determined by the damage type chosen for your favored medium. Um. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Penguin Witch Doctor mentioned, oh, good, you can uh, change the damage type with long rest. So do your research ahead of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. All right, so with with focused expression, the same thing. Like, uh, so you, you, you um, once per turn when you deal damage to at least target, you gain additional based on the, your chosen medium. Um, mm -hmm. So cold, uh, they take an additional D6 cold damage and must make a con save against your spell DC on a failed save, reduce speed. Okay, we know this. Uh, this right. We've seen this before. Uh, That's basically the frostbite cantrip. Yep. Sounds good. All right, cool. <laughs> uh, fire, um, let's see. That's going to be additional D6 fire damage. And flames dance around uh, one creature of your choice within 30 feet. The chosen creature gains a D6 temporary hit points. I like that. I like so they uh -huh. did they did something with the last batch of druids where they talked about not just the destructive properties of fire but the cleansing and healing properties of fire. Right. Yeah. And I like that they're bringing this back. Um, I like that as well. Yeah, and then lastly lightning is a d6 lightning damage, uh dexterity saving throw and the target is unable to take reactions. Um okay. Yeah, I mean that's not horrible either, right? Um I right. I I do I almost would want that one to do a D8 damage as opposed to a D6. I mean, th the thing about these abilities is they, they happen once per turn. There oh, is no limit. Yeah. These are infants. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I'm, you're right. In that case, I would drop cold and fire to D4s. Yeah, because it's a little bit, right? It's a good boon, mm -hmm. but that's a lot of damage if you're running around. I mean, uh, potentially you're a druid. You're running around in like wild shape form. You're smashing folks with huge claws and also doing these things. I mean, that's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is pretty strong. Pretty strong. Um, the, 
The last one is at 14th level impeccable physicality. Um, your relentless dedication and training uh, grant you proficiency in dexterity saving throws if you do not already have it. Um, if you're a druid, sorcerer, or wizard, you don't. Um, you gain, uh, additionally, when you make a dexterity saving throw, you can tre treat excuse me, a d20 roll of 9 or lower as a 10. That's awesome. I like so, yeah. that. See, I so. you know, we, we, when, uh, in, when we were in beta version of the show, we were, we were going through different classes. And one of the things that always disappointed me was the, the pinnacle ability of a lot of, a lot of different classes because mm -hmm. I, they didn't feel cool. They didn't feel like they did something awesome. This yeah. is, this is pretty cool. Um, I like I'm, it. I'm pretty happy with that one. So here's the one downside. Mm -hmm. If you decide to take this, this, uh, school and you are playing a sorcerer. You get the first level abilities. Mm -hmm. You get the sixth level abilities. You don't get your next choice until 14th. Yeah. You have to choose between focused expression and impeccable physicality. And then you get a second choice at 18th, um, which is their pinnacle ability. So potentially, if at 14th, you take the 14th level one, at 18th level, you are choosing an ability that other characters could have gotten at 10th level. Yeah. So, meh. But... Uh, you know who's playing eighteenth level sorcerers these days? Anyways, come on. <laughs> yeah, I you know I I do I do like I, I I like this, and I think for a sorcerer I would go with the tenth. I would go with the tenth, and I would ignore the fourteenth yeah. till eighteen. Um, mm -hmm. what do, what's uh uh what's the sorcerer's strong saving throw? Um, oh, making me do research. Uh, I expect because if, if it's already dex, <laughs> right? Because they because their weak one is cha. Which is their primary, but it's still their weak one. But their their strong one, I think, it might be Dex or Con. Sorcerers are proficient in Constitution and Charisma. Oh, okay, Con then. All right, okay, yeah. So that's a bummer, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Mage of Quandrix. Oh man, there's there they they did give us a fair amount to go through, so. Uh, here we go. Mage. There are five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mage of Quandrix. Uh, for those who become mages of Quandrix, math and magic go hand in hand. Such individuals learn to break down <laughs> natural phenomena do, 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 into uh, their core <laughs> numerical components. And through manipulation of those, alter reality on a whim, uh, Ooh, so on exciting. and so forth. All right. So uh, using the subclass section, we know all about that. Let's start with Quandrix spells. Okay. This one seems right up your alley. So why don't you uh why don't you start us off? I love this. So uh you immediately learn the cantrip guidance and the first level spell guiding bolt. Um which I'm a huge fan of guiding bolts. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fantastic spell. Uh I do hate missing with it, but still. <laughs> um that's you hit the target and the next person to hit them gets advantage, which feels like I've learned a secret. Yeah. Um you also get a cool list of spells um including enlarge reduce um feels very mathematical mm -hmm. um uh circle of power freedom of movement pass wall control water haste automatically should be in here yep. spike growth is an interesting choice but uh it is one about like making nature react i suppose yeah. so i like yeah. that okay cool um so it doesn't quite have the full math theme you know it's not like a time source or anything i do yeah. like it Okay. Uh, all right. Functions of probability. So uh, by Here iterating on the mathematical patterns of reality, you can nudge chance to tilt around a creature. When you uh, cast a spell using a spell slot, uh, the target creature at least, or uh, that targets at least one creature, you can choose that creature or another creature within 30 feet of it, including yourself, and add one of the following benefits. Oh. Right. Okay. Diminishing function mm -hmm. is number one. The chosen creature must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC, or the creature must roll a D6 and subtract the number rolled from the next attack roll it makes before the start of your next turn. That's so cool. it gets it gets bardic disinspiration. <laughs> All right. Yeah, no, I like I, okay. I I like that. I like I like anything anything that you can penalize the DM with. So mm -hmm. uh I like diminishing function so far. <laughs> All right, tell me about supplemental function. Supplemental. Once before the start of your next turn, the chosen creature can roll a d6 and add the number rolled to an attack roll or a saving throw of its choice. Um, and again, it can roll uh, after the d20, but before it's said like, oh, I've succeeded or failed. Okay. So you're basically right whenever you're casting any spell that's going to affect anyone at all. Um, you could either penalize or 
or boost someone by a d6. All right. Well, first off, this is going to get reduced before whenever it gets gets into publication. Uh, we're going to be dropped down to you know uh, proficiency mod times per short rest at the at the biggest. <laughs> it's going to be smaller than that. It's probably going to be proficiency times a day, or it's going to be something like that. But uh, already, Sometimes it's every spell, every right. spell. <laughs> well, every spell slot, spell slot, spell right. So sure, you know, sure. think about yeah. when you're casting. How many cantrips do you cast versus spell slot spells? Lower levels. Uh, you know, you're doing much more cantrips, but when you get into those higher levels, like, you know, you get up to like six, seven, when you have a, a large chunk of spells, you're going to be doing this very often. Yeah. And when you're a, um, uh, oh, actually let's, let's, let's take a quick look at who was allowed to beat us. Sorcerers and wizards. Yeah. Okay. Same, same, same. Um, right. right. Yeah. So, all right. So what, what are we, a wizard at like seventh level? Um, say seventh level? Yeah, about seventh level. I, you know, I really uh, think about fifth level is when when it starts to teeter, but by seventh level, you're going to be mostly casting level spells. Yeah, and you get 11 spells a day at that point. So you're using that ability 11 times. Yeah. Yep. yep. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, once you hit sixth level, both mm -hmm. of these are going to get velocity shift. You learn to manipulate kinetic formulas and alter the velocity of another creature. Uh, when a creature you can see starts its turn or moves to a space within 30 feet of you, you can use your reaction, already happy, to force the creature to make a charisma save against your spell save DC. They're going to fail that, mm -hmm. which it can choose to fail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On a failure, the creature is teleported to an unoccupied space of your choice that you can see within 30 feet of you. Um, that's uh, You can use that a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus per day. Yeah. So, that's nice. You just like get out of here, move, or to your friends, go over there now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. And it uses your reaction. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is great. Which is I great. mean, uh, more uses for reaction, especially for, for spellcasters. I like it a lot. Yeah, yeah, I do too. It's powerful. I like it. Cool. <clears throat> Null level? equation. Mm. Um, so null equation makes me think of the rule, or what is it? The, the, there was, um, this whole thing talking about zero and calc not in calculating for zero and how they had to sort that out in order to be able to do some of the math that they do for space. Cause you know, uh, we, we, oh, oh wait, no, it's the airplane thing, right? You've told me this. So what, if you're, if you're, if you're redesigning an airplane and it's, Oh yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and it has bullet holes everywhere. Right. The, right. The, the yeah. play, armor the, theory. Mm -hmm. Armor theory. There we go. You're right. <laughs> when I read null equation, I was like, Oh man, this, this sounds like, this exactly sounds like that because you're not right. you're not solving for where the holes are you're solving for the where the holes aren't right on all the planes that never made it back because they exploded exactly yeah, absolutely yep. yeah yeah exactly. if these can still make it back they're fine don't yeah. mess with that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly but no okay uh, null equation for us is a little bit differently so through careful calculations uh, you beset your enemies with abstract equations that reduce their might. Once per turn, immediately after dealing damage to a creature, you can force that creature to make a con save against your spell save DC. On a failure, the creature has disadvantage on strength and dexterity saving throws, and its weapon attacks deal only half damage. Uh, these effects last until the start of your next turn. You can use this... Uh, um, a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. That's that cool. is huge. That's huge. I mean, the good news is it is a const. I mean, from the DM standpoint, it's a constitution saving throw. So our biggest brutes are probably going to make that save. So you, mm -hmm. you can't just be like, all you do is hit us really hard with weapons. How about half damage for the rest of, you know, your short life? Right. Um, Cause we're, you know, we're fighting you now. Yeah. Um, but uh that's that's strong. That's great. Yeah, and I think that's strong, but not overpowered. So I don't think we'll see any yeah. revisions to that. Or mm -hmm. if there is, I'll be very surprised unless it's like a whole revamp uh, yeah. whenever we see the published version. Right. Wow. Wow. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we um, go. Quantum tunneling. And last, quantum tunneling. Which is going to be uh, good for a wizard, but a sorcerer is going to have to make a decision. Yes. Yes. Um, and so this one is... Um, you well, first of all, just being good at math makes you resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage like that. Um, 
You, you alter the foundational equations of your very being. Uh, additionally, you can move through other creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain, but you take a D10 force damage for every five feet you move while inside another creature or object. Um, if you, you end your turn inside a creature or an object, you are shunted into the nearest unoccupied space you last occupied. So this is wild. I mean, that's like having, um, uh, what's the, the third level spell where you become... Gas, gaseous form. That's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. You basically have that all the time. I love the shunting mechanic. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, I mean, we're not only talking about like, oh, there's an ogre here. I'd like to be on the other side of them. This is like, I'd like to move through that wall and see what's over there. Right. Um, The the limits of the map are no longer limits for you as long as you can take the damage. Yeah. No, that's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I'd have to think about who who would take that though, right? Like, um, you know, because classically we think of sorcerers and wizards as kind of squishy. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there is I I would almost think this might be a good fit for a couple of the sorcerers, the the um, the unliving sorcerer for one, uh, just because of their durability. Uh, the oh, dra- but... dragon sorcerer for another one, but this is their subclass, so they can't be those. Oh, <laughs> you are correct. So, <laughs> oh man, huh? That's tough. It's tough taking ten force damage as a sorcerer or a wizard. I mean, that's a huge amount. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's level fourteen, so you're averaging like eight hit points by then if you're a wizard, maybe nine. Right. If mm-hmm. you if you invested anything into con. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which you know, I don't know. Maybe you do. There's there's some decent things here which I, yeah. I think can make that useful. I would not want to. And again, you can only move your speed. Still, you're not getting faster. No. So probably you're teleporting 30 feet you know yeah um so 3d10 yeah i think this this leads to a lot of fun options that i mean that's an escape route that no no one else has no one (laughs) exactly yeah no no i mean ultimately i think it's cool it's just it's like as a sorcerer i'm taking null equation before i take quantum tunneling this is interesting so the the first one felt very warrior paladin style you know um the second one felt like you were playing a, a rogue or a monk uh this one doesn't give me feelings of another class no no it's it's pretty unique and that's cool yeah i like um, that yeah i will say so far it seems like the quandrix uh subclass is the most all over the board the other ones mm-hmm. kind of fit i feel like they fit a more linear s- solid theme but it seems like there's cool options with quandrix yeah um, that, you are a you are a meddler <laughs> it, ex- yeah exactly oh man all right, uh, Mage of the Silver Quill. Now, uh, so this is going to be your Bard, Warlock, and Wizard. Uh, okay. And and their, uh, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think it's blue and white, but I'll have to, you know, I should have done some research and remembered what the schools were before we came on here today, but uh, <laughs> whatever. Um, I'll so, go look and read the description. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, you know, it, so, so their magic is through the power of words, um, which makes sense for Bard and any Warlock and Wizard. Um so this subclass same format as the other ones and you start as an eloquent apprentice so you learn one cantrip of your choice either sacred flame or vicious mockery Uh, remember vicious mockery can be dad jokes uh and it doesn't count uh, against any number of can or uh yeah any number of cantrips you know and is added to the class spell list uh if it isn't there already additionally you gain a proficiency of your choice of the following skills deception intimidation performance persuasion or insight I like that. Instead yeah. of getting bonus spells, you get, you know, bonus skill proficiencies. Yeah, I love it. I'm, I'm in. I, you know, I would. I think I'd rather get, you know, more skill proficiencies than additional spells. Right. If you're playing this class and you were going to take wordy spells already, I don't need them on my bonus spell list, right? Mm-hmm. Because I'm yeah. going to pick them. It always just means, well, I have those, so now I have to pick things that are unlike the type of character i want to play mm-hmm. i know with a lot of kids that i play with the bonus spells always throw them off they're like but i i want those what do i do now <laughs> yeah and the idea is you get you know more breath but you want to focus all right uh let's see silvery barbs you invoke words laced with magic to demoralize your foes and turn their misfortune into a boon to bolster what? your allies so immediately cool. after a creature you see within 60 feet of you, that's pretty cool, succeeds on an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw, you can use your reaction, yes, to demoralize the creature, <laughs> unless the creature is immune to being charmed, uh, and it re-rolls the d20 and must take the lower roll. 
Uh, okay. I love this. Yeah, it's uh, so good. And then uh, if the attack roll ability check saving throw then fails, you can choose a different creature you can see within 50, 60 feet of you. Uh, and you can choose yourself. And that creature is empowered and can reroll one attack roll ability check or saving throw. It makes within one minute and uses the higher result. So uh, you can wow. only be empowered by this once. And uh, once a creature fails an attack roll ability check or saving throw because of a reroll forced by the feature, you can't uh, use this feature again until you finish a long rest uh, unless you expend a spell slot to regain its use. And this is just Jeez. a spell slot. So you can, you can, you can, you can first level, fifth level, whatever. Uh-huh. Well, there's a, there's a lot going on there. Holy cow. <laughs> that is a wild um, power. So let's see. So the, the idea is you see an enemy, they're about to hit one of your friends. You grant them disadvantage. If they fail the check, you get to give one of your friends advantage that they can yeah. use in the next minute. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. Um, interesting that's very interesting yeah. um and if they hit with that attack you get to keep the power and use it again next round mm-hmm. so yeah yeah i like a it great reaction i mean yeah. holy cow that's fantastic <laughs> that's fun i would i would totally okay. burn spell slots to use that over and over again and i think that's a good I would. that's a good kind of resource management um ability to because because part of your job as a dm as as is to drain your players resources so they get to do, use all their crazy tricks and, and do all their fun stuff right mm-hmm. right uh, give them the ability to do it and make them um you know pay for it because it's thrilling that way and i love it yeah and so yeah no i love silvery barbs this is this may be this may be a one of my top favorite powers i've seen so far today i agree with that all right. Well, at sixth level, they're getting an inky shroud. Okay. Uh, you learn the darkness spell. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, get that out of your list. Great. Um, you can cast the spell without expending a spell slot, although you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. When you cast the spell in this way, you can see normally through the darkness created. And when a creature you can see starts its turn in the darkness, you can deal 2d10 psychic damage to that creature. Um, yes. You can also cast that spell normally without the additional effects by using spell slots. Okay, so um, you cast darkness normally, but this this once per uh, long rest. Uh, I mean, it's basically it's a lot like the uh, tentacles, uh, mm-hmm. black tentacles Everett's style black spells. Yeah. yeah, but I love that you get the the ability to see through it. That's not a thing you normally get. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and. I- what I what I will point out though is that it just deals two d ten psychic damage, boom. Mm-hmm. Um, no save. No save. Nothing. Um, and I, it's as many people as start within that. There's it's not one creature, the yep. first creature. It's all of them. <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, huh. I wonder how. Like, I don't know if that's out of balance because it says creatures. If it said mm-hmm. enemies, but since it says creatures, but it's you can see starts so you can you can deal right i mean what, what's the darkness spell a uh, is it a 20 foot radius uh so. 60 feet across 30 foot radius oh jeepers okay yeah right? so huge zone right it might be um, it might be 20 i'd have to look it up i don't know uh I, I always question how to run darkness because when it happens, does the person know where the closest edge is? I mean, some DMs play that way so they can get out in one turn easily. Some uh, I sometimes roll randomly and people roll like run the long way through the darkness trying to get out and they're still trapped in it. Um, so potentially this could work on the same creature multiple times. Yes, uh, sixteen, uh, sixty feet. Uh, sixty feet. So then definitely. That's hard oh no! To get oh out no! Of. Sorry, sixty foot range, fifteen foot um, diameter. Oh, 15. Okay. Yeah, so it's a little bit smaller. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But even so, that's still that's still a, a, a big chunk of space. Um, and you're safe in the darkness. Yeah. And, and you can see. <laughs> and and ready, Rich, I have the solution for you on the darkness question. How to figure yeah. that out is use a battle mat. <laughs> <laughs> you monster. You monster. <laughs> God. I'll get back to battle mats someday. Um, oh, man. <laughs> all right. 10th level. 10th level. The infusion right. of eloquence. Here we go. Changing mm-hmm. gears. When you cast a spell that deals damage, you can invoke additional words of power to change the spell's damage type to your choice of psychic or radiance. 
Um, any creature damaged by the spell takes extra damage equal to your proficiency bonus, and it has its emotion swayed with despair or adoration based on the damage type dealt. Nice. There is no save for these. Psychic, the creature is frightened of you until the start of your next turn. Radiance, the creature is charmed by you until the start of your next turn. Uh, you can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. That's solid. That's solid. It's not great. It's not bad. I think it's solid. I I mean, I, those frightened abilities. Is like, frightened, is, frightened is powerful. Charmed is also powerful. Like, yeah. I hit you with radiant damage, and also, by the way, now you're charmed by me. Yeah. So just, I don't know, hang out for a round and yeah. then we're going to hit you again in a minute. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's also great that you can only do it a number of times equal to proficiency bonus once per day. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Words of power. You can invert, 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 invert. invert. I'm the uh, Swedish chef all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, you can invoke a word of power. Uh, that is the pinnacle of your magical study. You gain the following options. Okay. Oh, uh, Maybe. Oh, I was on the wrong screen. There we go. That's why it didn't oh. go. <laughs> All right. Uh, deadly Despair. So uh, when a uh, target of your Silvery Barbs fails an attack roll, an ability check, or saving throw, uh, because of the reroll, you can invoke a Word of Despair to give that target vulnerability uh, to one damage type of your choice until the start of your next turn. Huge. Huge. Uh, <laughs> selfless Invocation. A uh, creature you can see within 60 feet of you takes damage. You can uh, you can invoke a word of power using your reaction to grant that creature resistance to that damage, and you take an amount of psychic damage equal to the damage the creature takes. Okay. So overall, a lot of like dualistic choices in this one that I like a lot. Yeah. Um, I think that's really, really fun uh, overall as a class. I mean, you were really messing with some people, which mm -hmm. is neat, but it's got some like warlock style vibes to it that I like a lot. Yeah. Um, this one, again, uh, can be taken by bard, warlock, or wizard. Warlock or wizard have the same progression, but bards, you're going to miss out on one ability. So either the 10th or the 14th level. Um, that's a tough choice, um, honestly. Yeah. I, I, well, and I'm looking at selfless invocation. I'm I'm not so sure about the taking of damage. I think I would do deadly despair. So I think if I were only going to take inky shroud or uh, or sorry infusion of eloquence or uh, word of power, I would take infusion of eloquence every time. I think so too. Just because uh, there are, I mean, few limits on that one. When you cast a spell that deals damage, that can be a cantrip. All right, are you ready, Rich? Because it's time for speed round. Because we got to get through this one quick and wrap up for the next show that everyone <laughs> should stick around for. Uh, <laughs> New Pantheon Academia. Oh, uh, I was prepared to end. Are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? I think we could do it. Ready? All right. So Wither Room is uh, black and green. I know this. Druid and yes. Warlock subclasses. Let's get Boom. good. Wither Boom spells, uh, Lesser Restoration, Rave of Fema. All that stuff looks good. Revivify, Vampire Touch. All that stuff looks very appropriate. This is the one that I think stuck Ooh. to theme the most when I looked over it. They also, they get Spare the Dying, Cure Wounds, and Inflict Wounds, which yep. is just life and death is yours. Like, exactly. Just, get, just do it. Yeah. yeah, so Essence Trap is a bonus action. You can draw on reserves of life essence and power yourself for one minute. So Overgrowth, uh, you can choose this benefit and gain it as a bonus action on subsequent turns. You know that word. Uh, yep. While the uh, benefit lasts, you can ex uh, spend and roll one hit dice and regain a number of hit points equal to that, uh, minus or plus your spellcasting modifier. Cool. I'm into it. I love it. Uh, withering Strike. Uh, when you deal damage, you can change the damage type to Necrotic, and you ignore your resistance to a Necrotic. Oh, my God. I love this because there's that certain cantrip that never hits anything because uh, everything is resistant to Poison Spray. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's see. You can use this feature a number of times equal to proficiency bonus, and you regain them a long rest. Uh, I, awesome. I, I think that's good. I would almost go short rest because of how, well, healing's good. Less for a minute. Um, so with overgrowth in one minute, you can get all your hit dice. I mean, oh, all of them. oh, it does last for a minute. Right. Okay, yeah, never mind. Yeah, yeah. The withering strike—that's a combat. Yeah, cool. Um, level six, wither bloom brew. You gain yeah. proficiency with herbalism kits if you don't already have it. When you finish a long rest, you can use your kit and a cauldron to create magical brews. Um, create a number of brews equal to your proficiency bonus, so like three, four. Um, each brew requires a flask. Great. You can choose one of the following benefits: fortifying. Um, when you create this one, choose a damage type, cold fire, necrotic poison, or radiance. They can drink it and, or administer it to another creature as an action, and they gain resistance for one hour to that damage type. Sweet. Quickening. Um, 
the recipient regains 2d6 hit points and one disease or condition from the following list uh, ends. Um, charmed, frightened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. That's awesome. Um, and then toxifying, uh, you apply it to a simpler martial weapon. Um, the next time that deals damage, it'll do 2d6 poison damage, and they must succeed on a con saving throw or be poisoned for one minute. Um, those are the things I expect potions to do. Yeah, and, <laughs> so and that's, that's great. great. Uh, so Wither Bloom Adept, also pretty cool. Uh, once per turn when you deal necrotic damage or restore hit points from a spell, one target creature gains additional uh, hit points equal to your proficiency bonus and that's solid and then lastly withering vortex when you cast a spell using a spell slot that steals necrotic damage to any number of creatures that aren't on dead or constructs choose uh choose one of the creatures that took damage you drain an amount of life energy equal to half the damage dealt to that creature and one other creature other than yourself uh you can see within 30 feet regains a number of hit points equal to life drains fantastic i love it so much i love everything that's here and uh with that I'm going to say make sure to uh, follow us on the <laughs> social medias, uh, uh, you know, Albert Soup, DJ Private Rabbits, R. Melina, all the things. Everyone stick around for the next show and we will see you next week. <laughs> we'll have so much more to say about this. We promise. Uh, uh, I love it.